Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by Obine County Tourism. Thank you, Zach, and welcome everyone to Real Foot Forward, where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee, and I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Zach, before I introduce today's guest, what's something you discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? I was recently at a evening event here, and we went up to Cooper Tower, and I did not realize at nighttime the ceiling looked like stars and even had shooting stars from time to time. Uh, just seeing outside of the tower and seeing that was pretty cool. That is something that a lot of people miss unless they come to an event at night. And some people may not have even realized it. But, yeah, you're right. You can stand in there and see the stars in the real sky and see the mm-hmm. stars up above on the ceiling. Um, it's a really cool experience. If uh, anybody's coming to our big uh, gala in early March, be sure you pop up there and check that out. It's a lot of fun. So thank you for sharing. So our guest today is Mr. Rodney McConnell. Our topic is biking, tourism, and a very cool bike ride that's coming up that comes through this area, which is the ride, the fault line. It's really cool. Welcome, Rodney. Thanks for the opportunity to be here with you. So tell us a little bit about you. I know that you uh, have a bike repair shop in New Madrid and that you um, have obviously been passionate about biking for a long time. Tell us a little bit about you. Okay, well, um, I've had an interesting career. Of course, I'm retired now and uh, started out in education many, many years ago in the mid-70s. Had a 30-year career in education and then decided to look for something new and different to do and one thing we came up with we had been doing some cycling tours on our own just for our own uh participation in them and we we looked at them and thought hey this wouldn't be that difficult to do and so we looked at ways to do that and and started out to do one about 10 12 years ago now when did you first discover that you enjoyed bike riding well probably right around the late 90s uh, missouri had just completed the Katy Trail. It's a rail trail conversion. It's the longest one in the United States. It draws lots of people. We had gone up and ridden that and enjoyed it. And we rode, you know, individual sections, like 15, 20 miles at a time for a couple, three years. And then we heard about a ride that took place every summer that rode all the way from one end to the other, which is about 220, 30 miles. So we thought we would be really ambitious, uh, myself and a friend of mine, and and do that one summer. We did it like it so well we did it several years in a row and uh from there we decided well we're kind of tired of doing this one over and over so we had to branch out and look at doing what they call road rides because there's not that many trails that that go that much of a distance so we began those uh back right around 2010 and did several of those and that's where we got the idea for the for the road ride that we're doing now in in the four state area and so um i know you were uh you taught media is that right uh, AV and things like that. Right. Yeah. Television, uh, radio, video production. Mm-hmm. So that was probably fun. A fun way to be able to shoot video while you're on your bike. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I, hardly a trip goes by now that I don't have a GoPro or uh, some other kind of camera. Of course, nowadays you can do both video and stills with your cell phone, but it's, it's kind of hard sometimes to work with them out in the bright sun. So usually I have regular cameras with me as well. Now, what, um, what was your first bike? How far back do you want to go? <laughs> my very first bike that I ever had was a hand, hand-me-down Western Flyer from my sister back in the 60s. <laughs> yeah. Was a Schwinn. <laughs> That's right. And so I rode that one uh, for probably four or five years. And then I got one of those early uh, banana seat bikes and had that for another four or five years. And then like a lot of people do, once they get their driver's license, you know, took some time off probably 20, 30 years from bike riding and, and didn't have one at all. And then, uh, back in the eighties, I got, you know, the idea that I needed to, uh, get in shape, lose some weight. So I bought my orange five speed from, from Kmart, rode that a while until we got serious, like like I said, about 20 years ago. And then we went with, you know, uh, higher, you know, higher brand name, type bicycles from a bike shop up until that time it all been from like big box stores and what have you so there you go see that's nice that's that everybody's got to start somewhere 
And then eventually uh, you started a bike repair shop, right? Well, actually, no, I don't have a shop. I work for the one in Cape Girardeau part time, like when they have, uh, especially spring, early summer, when they have a lot of people looking to buy bikes and a lot of people getting their bikes tuned up after the winter and, and having repairs made. So I will go up there one, sometimes two days a week uh, to help them out. And, and that was how um, I learned enough to serve as kind of like a backup mechanic on our tours. Uh, we usually have a regular full-time mechanic that does the, the majority of the support, mechanical support. But in case they get overwhelmed or whatever, I know enough about it that I can do most of the basic stuff. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing worse than being on a ride and having your uh, tire go, Psh! terrible feeling. Well, uh, yeah, that can be very discouraging, and especially if you don't know how to do anything about it, and there's no one there to help you. So we try and uh, and have what they call SAG uh, vehicles out on the course uh, all the time with people with air pumps and, and a few spare tubes uh, to, to assist that most common of the issues that come up with the flat tires. Now, when you're talking to friends who want to get into biking, what kind of bike do you recommend that they start off trying out? Well, it depends on what they're wanting to do. I mean, if, if you move up beyond, like I said, the department store, a big box Walmart type level, there are a number of different specialty types of bicycles you can get. If you're primarily going to ride it on paved surfaces, they call it road bike. If you're primarily going to do off-road on, on in, in, like on uh courses that are set up specifically a lot of kids high school age kids and even college age kids will ride mountain bikes on these courses like northwest arkansas down uh, is a huge mountain bike capital of probably the united states where they do a lot of mountain biking but they're big and heavy because they have to take a lot of shocks and so it's not something you want to ride around your neighborhood or on the uh, on, on, on a lengthy multi-hundred mile road ride. Uh, and then recently in the last 10 years or so, a new thing came along called gravel specific bikes that are kind of like a cross between a road bike and a mountain bike such that you can ride them both on pavement as well as if you encounter some gravel like you would on a rail trail conversion like the Katy Trail or like in some counties here in southeast Missouri, the county roads are not paved; they're just they're just gravel. So you can ride them both paved and gravel equally as well. And so that that's currently the where the, all the action is right now is with those. So uh, it it just mainly depends on what your what what your primary location and riding service is going to be. Really, is there a brand for just road biking that you lean towards? Well, it happened that the first one I ever got was from a company called Specialized. Uh, my wife actually got that for me to replace my orange Kmart uh, about 20 years ago when we started getting serious about doing a lot of riding. And the Kmart was made out of steel and it was quite heavy. And so we wanted something lighter. And we went at first initially with aluminum, which is lighter than steel. So that was from a company called Specialized, which has been around since the mid-70s. And at that time, uh, there was a dealer for it in Cape. So... Um, they fixed her up with that. She gave it to me as a surprise for, actually, I believe it was for her anniversary. And I rode that one for about five years until we started doing the road rides. It had a suspension fork and was really more nearly suited for off-road. So it weighed about 10 pounds more than a true road bike. We wanted to shed some of that weight when we were doing these three and 400 mile week long road rides. So I opted for a specialized carbon fiber at that point, which is even lighter than aluminum and uh, have been riding specialized carbon fiber on my, I'm on my third one right now ever since. And of course there's a number of other brands out there specialized. Uh, unfortunately, a couple of years ago decided they would change their marketing strategy and decided to stop supporting local bike shops and working through them and now sells direct to the consumer uh, through, you know, kind of like an Amazon type of an operation. So, uh, you know, there's other brands, there's Giant, there's Cannondale, there's Trek. Trek is very uh, famous and popular, especially back in the day when Lance Armstrong was riding the Tour de, Tour de France um, for several years in a row uh, as one of the American riders. Yeah, unfortunately, he, he was doing some... Uh, <laughs> you know, legal uh, things that made him be his superior performance. So he's kind of fallen out of favor now, but he wrote a trek. And uh, so that made trek extremely popular back in about 20 years ago. So there's a number of brands that you can get. 
uh, you know, if you're going to be serious about it, if you're going to do anything other than just ride around the neighborhood a couple blocks uh, once or twice a week, uh, I would recommend that you not get a bike from, a, you know, Target or Walmart or someplace like that. Because if for no other reason, the people who set them up are just stock people and they don't know what they're doing. And so you, if you go there and, and you look at them periodically, you'll see that the fork's been installed backwards or the brakes are on backwards uh, and things like this or the brakes fall off and because they're not tightened up properly. So you, if you're really serious and, and you want a dependable bike that'll last a long time, that's safe, going to a bike shop is probably the thing to do in getting a more, a more uh, recognizable specialty bike brand there. I do think it's unfortunate that a lot of people probably go to a uh, store like a, a Walmart or a Target or whatever or Amazon first to see if they like it. And then because it's not as good of a bike, it's not as good of a fit, they decide they don't like it and then they don't keep going. But if they started with a nicer bike, um, you know, they would like it a lot more. So um, anyway, yeah, I um, – I love my bikes, and whenever I'm driving down the interstate and I see bikes on the back of somebody's uh, trailer or um, their RV, I always look to see what kind of brand it is because I'm fascinated by the different brands of bikes. So tell me a little bit about what uh, got you started thinking that we needed a, a ride like the Ride the Fault Line, and the Ride the Fault Line goes through... Uh, I've got your website pulled up. Your website's really great, by the way. But you go through Missouri, Arkansas, Kentucky, and Tennessee in seven days. So uh, before we talk more detail about the ride itself, tell me what, what got you thinking about it. Well, uh was interesting. Like I said, we got started, a friend of mine and I got started on the Katy Trail first back in the early 2000s and then we did run out of trails to ride, so we thought, well, and this is the thing that occurs to a lot of people, we just weren't sure if we wanted to go out there and mix it up with cars on the regular highways, And but we decided, okay, well, we're, if we're going to, you know, keep riding and do something different, we're going to have to give it a try, so we heard about this ride out in Oklahoma that was being run at the time called Oklahoma Freewheel, so we went out there and did that a couple years and uh, learned that, you know, most of the ride organizers try and find lower traffic routes wherever possible. Occasionally you may, there may not be any other alternative other than to ride on a, a four lane highway for some distance to connect the, the lower traffic roads to each other. But by and large, they will put you on, you know, quiet, low traffic, rural farm to market type roads. And so uh, we found out that maybe it's not all that bad. After all, you just got to keep your wits about you. Don't wear headphones. You need to be able to hear what's coming up from behind you. Have lights, flashing lights on the front and the back, all that kind of thing where, where cars can see you. Uh, it's a big problem nowadays with cell phones and texting because that takes people's eyes off the road. So that makes people even a little more concerned about riding a bike because, well, they may not see me and, uh, you know, may run off over the shoulder and right when I'm there. And that is a concern. So uh, we work, uh, advocacy organizations for bicycles work toward that. But we we then decided, okay, this is a lot of fun in Oklahoma. And we heard about another one where you rode completely across the state of Kansas. So we we did that one one time. It was uh, over 400 miles. And that t- I think that took eight days. And I will say, because probably nobody from Kansas or very few will listen to this, Kansas is, in fact, a pretty flat state. And there's not a whole lot to see out there. And so it's just like, get on your bike at six o'clock in the morning, ride for about 60 miles and repeat seven times in a row. And so we decided that if all these other states had these rides, that we ought to be able to put one on here because, and, and we had the advantage that we had a lot of flat land and every everywhere we went, every trip we rode, whether it was Kansas even, which is more or less flat, but it does have a range of hills that run through it or Oklahoma or we did some in Georgia and so forth. Every day at the end of the route, people would be complaining about how hilly it was and how sore they were and how tired they were. So we thought, well, if they want flat, we can fix them up with some flat here in southeastern Missouri, western Kentucky and Tennessee in particular, on account of the river floodplain. And so we put together the route and tied it all together where we could do it in a week and we didn't exceed the amount of mileage that people would comfortably want to ride in a day, found some some towns that were spaced correctly for that and uh, who were willing to host it and had the facilities that you need for a bunch of cyclists to spend the night in. We decided to offer it. 
Uh, we were trying to look for something unique that we would have to give it an interesting name. And the main thing that we could come up with around here, because we don't have any waterfalls like Niagara Falls or any interesting archaeological formations like the Grand Canyon or anything like that, we knew we did have a, an earthquake fall, which was unique. And so that's where the name Ride the Fall Line came from. And it does run through three of the states. And so we decided Ride the Fall Line is what we would we would call it. It's amazing that when you find out, you start promoting it that way, how few people outside our immediate area have ever heard of the New Madrid Fault Line because it's been dormant for so many years. And so people are fascinated by that when they get here. We've had people who actually have checked out books at university libraries and read up on the fault line before they come to ride the route, which I was just astonished. And so each year we try and have, there's a, a facility in, in Memphis called the Center for Earthquake Studies who have learned about our ride and uh, offered to uh, work with us as far as providing speakers who could come up and talk to the cyclists about the fault line, what had happened back in the early 1800s, what the chances were that it might become active again, where it runs from one point to another, and that kind of thing. And so it's an educational event as well. And I try and do that. I guess my background as an educator and, and having kind of like an interest in history is what does that. You will go to rides, bike rides, that they don't do anything for you other than give you a map and a place to spend the night, and you're on your own. And so we decided, well, we want to have something to do at nighttime or we want to learn about what we're riding through. So we provide speakers uh, as often as we can. This year, as an example, we'll be going back to Arkansas for the first time probably since 2016. And we happened to discover, I didn't even know it was there um, until we researched this ride, that Ernest Hemingway lived in northeastern Arkansas for several years back in the 1920s and wrote his novel, Farewell to Arms, in a barn out back of their house. And so they have that all preserved. Arkansas State University has that preserved. And people are fascinated by that because they don't didn't know about it either. They get to see that. We have a speaker for that. And so anyway, we found other things. We found a historic drag strip down in Arkansas. That's the oldest functioning drag strip that's still in existence in the United States. Columbus Belmont uh, Civil War Battlefield. Many, many people don't know that that's there or what significance it had. Uh, and so... It's an, it's an educational project as well as a sports type event. And we've found that that appeals to a lot of people and causes them to want to, to come back. And then we try and vary the route, as, as I have mentioned to you before, each year to keep it interesting so that people will keep coming back for more, so to speak. Yeah. And, and for folks who are listening, some of our listeners may, may not realize the New Madrid fault line is a significant part of our history here in this region and especially here uh, in Obion County because back in 18, 11, and 12 there were a series of earthquakes along the fault line and it ended up opening up some of the land there around what is now Real Foot Lake and opened it up and the Mississippi River flowed backwards and filled up the lake and that's how we ended up with Real Foot Lake and so of course the bird watching, the hunting, the all the things that are in this area we attribute to that series of earthquakes. So uh, it's a big part of our culture here. It's a big part of what we do here at Discovery Park is educate folks um, on that. So t tell me, in addition to uh, some of the places you've already mentioned, what are some of the experiences that somebody who's riding the ride get to have along the way? Well, like I said, we're always on the lookout for new things. So so just to start at the beginning, uh, last year for uh, the uh, Sykes and Tourism uh, Bureau decided that they wanted to host a hot air balloon festival uh, in the area, and that was the first one they held, and it had wildly successful, had way more people than they ever anticipated, so I decided that I would start the ride here in Sykes, and we hadn't started here in Sykes for a number of years, and started off with them being able to go and see this hot air balloon festival, and that proved to be interesting. A lot of people enjoyed that. They had a lot of food vendors, food trucks, trailers, what have you there that the, that the cyclists could go and, and uh, patronize. And so we started that off. Well, of course, you say you mentioned you mentioned Sykeston, Missouri, and a lot of people around here think of throwed rolls. I know there's a famous restaurant there where they throw rolls at you. There he is. And we 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 mentioned that to them as that's one of the you know, a popular attraction. It's been on national TV, all this kind of stuff, always crowded, always a waiting line outside. So if they want to go there and eat there while they're in Sykeston, 
you know, we tell them about it. We tell them where it is. We tell them to go early if they want to stay out of the line. And uh, so, yeah, that's a popular attraction. And that's that's Lambert's. Is that right? Lambert's restaurant. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I could tell you the story about that, but it might, we'll probably deviate off a little bit from our from our top here today. <laughs> oh, that's OK. We like we like to deviate here. OK, well, Lambert's, um, I'll tell you just very briefly, has an interesting history. It was started by the Lambert family, obviously, back in the 40s here in Sykeston by the predecessors. Like you've got like third generation that runs it now. It was and it was because it was started by like their, I guess, grandparents who had originally lived in southern Alabama and were farmers. It was like like in the Depression era. And they were farmers and they weren't doing well and they were looking for new opportunities. So they decided to come north up to southeast Missouri. And the guy back in the 40s, World War II era, started up this little tiny cafe. Uh, it was probably big enough for maybe 20, 30 people on one of the major thoroughfares here in Sykes and Highway 61, also known as Main Street. And it was right across the street from a shoe factory that was here for a number of years. And so all the shoe factory employees would come over there and eat. So it was huge success. And it would get really, really crowded. And they served a, a diverse menu that included the need for, with some of the dishes, for dinner rolls. And they baked those fresh daily, and which is something that you don't find too often nowadays. And when it would get really crowded, eventually it got to a point when it was time to serve the rolls to the people they couldn't get to them. There was too big a crowd. So the proprietor, uh, who was known as Little Man Lambert, because he was very short, would just throw the rolls back across all the intervening customers and have the people catch them. And naturally, of course, that caught on. And that was how the legend of the throw to roll was begun. And uh, it became then so popular that they have been in, I think they are now in their fourth location having expanded that many times since it caught on back in like i think the 70s when they first started doing their first expansions and uh, a little man then turned it over to his son one of his sons who his name was norman who happened to be a football coach at the local high school and a very colorful character in a number of ways always wore a red bow tie when he was down at the restaurant he divided his time between being football coach and being down at the restaurant, he eventually got big enough that he had to hire a bunch of other people. And they use primarily, when they can get them, members of the local baseball team to be the servers of the rolls because they have the best aim throwing the rolls at the customers. And, and they're very much worth catching. I've, I've eaten there many times and it's delicious. Yeah, indeed they are. They're actually reasonably edible, although I always tell people that the recipe is is slanted towards making them not not necessarily just tasty, but aerodynamic so that they can be thrown properly and caught properly. But it's a lot of fun. We don't go there that often because it is such a long wait, even though we live right here and people find that fascinating. Uh, but we typically reserve our trips to Lambert's for when we have company in town, visitors who want to go there. And so we'll go with them or we have you know guests from out of town we haven't met before. We're entertaining and sites and we'll do that. And like with the bike tour, I, I, we explain it to them and, and they can go out there. But uh, yeah, so that's that's a brief history of Lambert's, how that began. And so as far as other events we look at, we, we're doing the Balloon Festival. We find obscure things that people don't know about. There is over at, and it's kind of like a long line of what you're doing there at Discovery Park, very specialized extent, over about 25 miles west of Sykes in a town called Bloomfield, Bloomfield, Missouri. There is a museum dedicated to the Stars and Stripes magazine that the military has published for many, many years. I think it dates back to the Civil War, and it actually began publication during the Civil War period in Bloomfield. And so they have this museum there dedicated to the history of Stars and Stripes magazine and all the uh, conflicts that they have covered since then, World War One to Korea, Vietnam, and so forth. And very few people know that it's there, and it's a very interesting place. Uh, they've got a lot of uh, uh, historical memorabilia on these various conflicts that have occurred and how it was reported by the reporters, you know, newspaper and primarily because it is a newspaper, but with some sections that have to do with, you know, other forms of media that have come along since then. So last year, for the first time ever, we took the bike tour by there and they had a fundraising lunch for them. And, uh, they, you know, they served them lunch and they can make a donation to the museum. To, because it's all done, run by charities 
And uh, it worked out well for the cyclists and the museum both. And so I already mentioned the Hemingway Museum down in Arkansas. We've been there. We've been to Columbus Belmont Battlefield in Hickman. When we go to Hickman, they are always excited to take us on tours of their local history, uh, historic structures. Uh, one of the main ones of which is their courthouse, which I'm sure you've probably seen. And uh, it's it's one of... It happens to have a still functioning clock tower where the clock still keeps time. And it's a 1904 Seth Thomas, which means it's, you know, well over a century old and still works. They still have a guy who goes up there and winds it every couple of weeks. And for those who are not afraid of heights, the county judge will actually take the cyclists up in the clock tower and let them see how this clock runs. And of course, it's rather large. It's not like a wristwatch. And so you can actually see the gears and everything else that make it work. And that fascinates people. Um, so we take them there uh, to do that. And so it's just a lot of interesting things, quite a lot of history, like I said, that I try and promote of the area and maybe enough of it that, you know, it will convince them that they need to come back some other time when they're not on a bike tour and see some other things that they couldn't, uh, didn't have time to visit. Now, I uh, have had the privilege of speaking to to your group Um and, and, you know, when I was on my way there, my assumption the first time was that these were, you know, 20 year old athletes, you know, who were biking. But as I was pleasantly surprised by, these were my peers. These were middle aged folks who like to ride bikes. And so, so I think folks who are listening right now who think, gosh, I wish I could do that. Uh, tell me a little bit about who your typical uh, riders are. Well, typical riders, uh, pretty much for any long distance tour that I'm familiar with, skew to middle aged and older. Um, and that's primarily because anybody younger than that, typically they're still in the prime of their of their career and, and they may get two two weeks vacation off per year. And a lot of them have families and they want to go to the beach or other places and they don't want to spend the whole week riding a bike. Uh, there are a few families who do it, uh, but, you know, it's not not real common with them. So, you know, we, we do way more people in the 50 to 80 year age group than we do in the 20 to 40 year age group. Now, there are a few tours around that specialize in live music and beer gardens, and they are the ones that will attract the 20 and 30 somethings nowadays because, uh, you know, that gives them something that it's more about the music and the beverages and the bicycling is just a, a means to an end for them. And so you need to be in in really good shape. This is not something you want to try and do as we found out the first time we did it 25 years ago or so. If you haven't ridden a bicycle in a while, uh, even if you're in the world's greatest condition, otherwise you will not be able to sit down after you have ridden one for more than five or 10 miles straight because you have to condition, we'll call it your posterior, to riding on a bicycle seat for extended distances over time, or you'll be in a world of hurt uh, after you do it for a while. And so uh, that's the main thing that you have to you have to keep in mind. You need to do some preliminary rides if you're going to do a longer event, multi-day event, to be in condition for that. And then, of course, the physical conditioning is important, but you can get that, you know, on an elliptical or a treadmill or something at a gym. As far as the stamina and the cardiovascular, there are some things that are unique to cycling that you have to keep in mind if you're going to go and do it. So you don't have to be outstanding athlete, you know, superstar track participant or whatever, but you got to be in reasonably good shape. We always recommend that people uh, go, especially if they haven't been that active and, and, and have a physical with their doctor before they go on one of these events, just so there's no surprises for anyone. Yeah. And it's, um, it's not a race. You know, and that's what I, you know, I really appreciated uh, because they've also visited Discovery Park and we've gotten to talk to and get to know some of the folks that were riding. And there's a great sense of camaraderie that I picked up on, you know, from everybody riding together and getting to know each other. It, it really is a, a good uh, vibe amongst the folks that are participating. Yeah, the sense of camaraderie is huge. And we have to be careful when we plan these routes that we don't interfere with that. We offer what I call all three types of overnight sleeping accommodations, which is pitching a tent out on the grounds uh, of the site, whether it's a high school or a community center, a courthouse or whatever it is, uh, indoor space, a gymnasium or, again, a community center, a YMCA, something like that, where if people want, they don't want to be outdoors because it might rain on them or there's mosquitoes and bugs or, you know, it's the temperature, they, they want 
climate control. So they want an indoor place. So we try and find a place that has a gym or a large meeting room or a place with a big flat floor that has air conditioning that they can roll out a sleeping bag and sleep in there. And then we also provide motels for people who just want, you know, that kind of accommodation. And we find a lot of times that the people in the motels will report that they are missing out on this camaraderie element of meeting new people and making friends because they are isolated by being in a room at, at a at a point distant somewhat from all the other people. So most people do, in fact, we only have maybe 10% of the people who want to do motels and the others, it's about 50-50 of the remainder who will do tent camping or uh, the, the sleeping bag, uh, air mattress kind indoors. But yeah, you will see people make great friends. And we have people who come back year after year who met people the first time they did it and they want to, you know, uh, reestablish contact with them each year. And that's true with every ride we've ever been on, whether it's Oklahoma, Kansas, uh, Georgia, or wherever. That That's a huge part of the experience. So if somebody is uh, listening right now and they're thinking, man, I, I want to look into, into this, where should they go for more information? Well, as usual, do a Google search would be my recommendation and search bike tours or bicycling, uh, whatever aspect of it you want to start out on first, whether it's what kind of bike do I need to get to ride trails or around the neighborhood or whatever. Or if you want to take, take a tour, do you want to do a road ride? Do you want to do a trail ride? Do you want to do one that's super comfortable, that stays in bed and breakfast in motels? Or do you want to do one that's a little bit more in touch with nature where you camp out and it's out in the woods? You know, there's there's something really for almost everyone out there. We we run a tour uh, besides Ride the Fault Line. I run tours now on the Katy. We, we started out riding up there. High-end tours where we stay in exclusively bed and breakfast and uh, historic hotels. And everything is done for you. You pay one price. And then you just ride and uh, takes uh, six days to do that. And uh, there's a lot, a huge amount of interest in that because, like I said, it's, it's the oldest uh, rail trail conversion. And, and right now it's still the longest and full, most fully developed rail trail conversion in the United States. There are two or three others that they're working on. Once they're completed, may may steal its title from it. But for right now, it's the premier rail trail. And so if that's the kind of thing you're looking for, and of course, no traffic to deal with there at all. So it's a great way to get started. And and so there's that kind of experience. So, yeah, Internet primarily or, or, you know, other cycling people, if you know cyclists, check in with them and, and, and see what experiences they've had. And then I mentioned that you have a new website and it's ridethefault.com and it's a great website with reviews and videos and the route and, you know, all kinds of really great information and links to the rest of the social media. So if you're interested in this one, uh, you can go to ridethefault.com. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate learning more about this and getting to know you a little better. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, like I said, we're, we're trying to keep it uh, uh, continuing, ongoing uh, opportunity for people in the area uh, and, and and people from outside the area to come and visit our area. And so, and that's that's a, a constant deal because there are other competing events. And and so the more people that hear about it and the more people, like you said, to check out our website and, and attend the event, the longer we'll be able to keep it, uh, uh, you know, bringing um, guests to our four state area. Excellent. And now we're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, Jennifer Wilds, Discovery Park's Director of Exhibits, is going to tell us a little more about those earthquakes along the New Madrid fault line that created Real Foot Lake and the creation of Discovery Park's Earthquake Simulator. If you're searching for a fun road trip, look no further than Obine County, Tennessee. From eagles to white squirrels and sunken cypress trees to dinosaurs, the entire region is filled with unique experiences and attractions just waiting to be explored. You'll find one-of-a-kind hotels, restaurants, wineries, and orchards, along with a charming downtown filled with shops. And of course, no visit to Obine County is complete without a stop at Discovery Park of America. To plan your trip, go to obinecounty.org slash visit. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Scott Williams, and we've been joined by Jennifer Wilds, Discovery Park's Director of Exhibits. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the fault line that we've been talking about and its relationship to us here at Discovery Park of America, and a little bit more about how Real Foot Lake came to be because of the earthquakes. So welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I realize that I just grabbed you as you were walking down the hall, so you've had zero time to prepare. But tell us a little bit about the earthquakes and the history and how they came to be. And I do want to know the real story, not the legend that everybody talks about. 
Okay, so there is the New Madrid Seismic Zone. It's essentially located where Tennessee and Missouri and Arkansas and Illinois, Kentucky all kind of meet. Um, and in that area, it's just more prone to earthquakes. There are fault lines underneath the ground in that area. It's called the New Madrid earthquake is what people typically hear. It's actually a series of earthquakes that occurred uh, from 1811 to 1812. And they started in December of 1811 and then carried over into February, March of 1812. So that's why we kind of say both years because it, it crossed two years. There were three major earthquakes during that time. There was one in December, one in January, one in February. Uh, but then there were also aftershocks throughout those months that numbered nearly 2000. So those couple of months were really detrimental to the people who lived in that area during that time. But one thing that occurred, of course, most of the land was um, severely affected, but in what's known as Real Foot Lake, in that area, the land kind of uh, sank into created basically a bowl and then the water from the neighboring uh, water systems uh, filled it up. So that's kind of what created, well, what helped create Real Foot Lake as we know it today. Now, that's the real story. What's the legend that sometimes we hear about, you know, with the Native American and the, the, the guy's foot and all that? Off the top of my head, I don't know all the details. Um, I just, what comes to me right now is, yes, it was a Native American legend where I believe there was a Native American that had a disfigured foot and he was attempting to wed the neighboring tribes, the chief's daughter, and the chief of that neighboring tribe um, became very angry when his daughter was stolen, essentially. And he reportedly stomped his foot on the ground, um, which caused the earthquakes. And so you're saying that probably did not happen? More than likely, no. Okay, my next question is you were here 10 years ago, 11, 12 years ago, when Discovery Park was first being planned. How, how do you remember you all were trying to accomplish incorporating Real Foot Lake and the culture there into the experience here at Discovery Park? There's a couple of different areas where we do include Real Foot Lake. Um, we have a gallery called the Regional History Gallery. And as far as the artifacts and those exhibits, the story we're trying to tell there, it's really focused on how the folks of the, that area made a living during the 18th and 19th centuries, um, you know, related to kind of in and around the lake area. So fishing, hunting, trapping, logging, things like that. And then we also have a 20,000 gallon aquarium with um, a couple of terrarium tanks as well which have examples of all the different kinds of species that you can find at Real Foot Lake. Because one of the things that came about from the creation of the lake was this beautiful, really unique ecosystem that was created and supports a lot of uh, diverse wildlife. Uh, so we have some examples of those different types of wildlife species that you can see when you come here. And then we also have an earthquake simulator, which I think is also, again, really unique and special because it's it goes beyond just explaining and demonstrating just what an earthquake is. It really goes into the story of how the New Madrid earthquakes occurred and what the people of that region experienced during that time. You do physically experience what, um, you know, vibrations similar to those earthquakes, but again, it's, it's really specific to those particular ones. And I can't have you in here talking about Real Foot Lake and not ask you about the exhibit that you just finished, Duck, Duck, Goose, Waterfowl of the Mississippi Flyway. I know you work each and every aspect of that. You've been working on it for two and a half years, and it's a huge hit. Everybody's talking about how awesome it is. So talk to me a little bit about that and what you were trying to accomplish with that new exhibit. Yeah, so that exhibit opened this past November, so it's still very, very new. It essentially discusses waterfowl hunting and waterfowl conservation and how the two uh, relate to one another, how they support one another. We have exhibits both inside of our main museum building called Discovery Center, and then we also have aspects outside in our settlement cabin area. And Real Foot Lake really shines uh, throughout the exhibit because on the one hand, when it comes to waterfowl hunting, it's just a habitat that really thrives as far as um, waterfowl are concerned. Um, so it's a very popular hunting spot. And then when you come to the conservation side of things, uh, also at the lake, at Real Foot Lake, there's a portion that is a protected refuge. So those are just safe stopover spots for waterfowl as they're um, migrating through the area. You really get to learn about both aspects of that um, 
throughout this whole exhibit. And so of everything there, I know what my favorite is. What is your favorite in Duck, Duck, Goose? I have a feeling my favorite is probably your favorite as well. It's the duck blind that we have. It is in the outdoor area I mentioned in our cabins, our settlement cabins. One of the cabins specifically focuses more on the waterfowl hunting side of the story. So to kind of expand that, we decided to construct a duck blind right behind that cabin. It's right on the edge of our existing water. And it's one that you can physically walk into. There's a motion activated aspect that when you do walk into, it kicks on some of the motion decoys that we have floating on the water. We have a lot of decoys on the water, but there are a couple of motion ones that, that there, it's really fun to see those in action. Yeah, I had no idea how realistic you know, th these look like these uh, decoys that are floating in the water. There's all different types of ducks floating out. There's really, really, and in, in, uh, uh, geese, and when you activate them, like you said, it looks like they've dunked over and some of them are kicking their feet. It's really, really fascinating. So yeah, that that's my favorite part. Although I also like the part, the screen where you can listen to the different uh, deck calls, because I think that's really interesting. A lot of people don't get to experience that. So I've learned a lot living in this area. I'm really grateful for the opportunity that you've created for us to learn all about duck hunting and conservation. Uh, it's an important part of our culture here. And so I'm glad we get to share it with all of our visitors. So thank you for that. No problem. And thank you to all of our listeners who've joined Jennifer, Zach, and me today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com.